How's it going and welcome to No Fun Allowed's Guide series on Crisp Strahd, a 5th edition module. Today we're going to be wrapping up the Amber Temple because my oh my is there are a lot to dive in with that. So players do not watch this but DMs that want edit insight on how we can wrap this thing up. Let's go ahead and get started. So in the previous videos we've gone over the first floor entirely. We've gone over the majority of the second floor but most important of all that second episode had all of the sarcophagi and how they can be implemented into the campaign. So today we're going to be finally looking at all of the final bits of this area, including the final of the Amber Sarkovgai, which are the big ones. These are the game changers. So let's go ahead and start off with Area 34, the Wizard's Bedchamber. This place clearly used to be an incredible bedchamber at some point. These ceilings were 10 feet high, but now they're covered in webs. There once were wards to protect from theft, however they have long since faded away. Inside of here your players can get access to 4 Golden Hawks or 250 GP each. If you have a group of players that have sticky fingers, they're going to be coming out of this Amber Temple filthy stinking rich. Once again, that really comes down to what can they actually spend their money on in the land of Barovia. How much money are they actually spending in order to get certain things in the lands of Barovia. It really comes down to the individual game of course. But I'm willing to bet that there is a lot of loot here that your players may not take because they may fear it's cursed to some degree. This one isn't, but hey, you can always keep your players guessing. In Area 35, we have the Sleeping Guardian. When your players make their way inside of here, they can find standing in the center of the room is this massive Shield Guardian. Because every single 5th edition module has to shoehorn in a Guardian for some reason. I don't know why. It's oh, it, I, I, I don't I don't understand. <laughs> but regardless, it does allow you to have a fun theme running through the course of campaigns where, oh, this is Shield Guardian A, this, that, oh, remember Shield Guardian B? I, I guess that's what they're going for? I'm not too sure. But regardless, this Shield Guardian in particular can be one of the harder ones to actually achieve because the only way to get that Shield Guardian amulet is from Villainous all the way up there at the top. And depending on how you roleplay him up, your players may not get that Shield Guardian Amulet, in which case they'll come in here and discover that this thing is completely unusable. So here's the thing, Shield Guardians are incredibly powerful. If you incorporate them into your campaign, your player's skill level and strength range just absolutely shoots through the roof. This thing it hits incredibly hard, it regenerates, it helps out whoever is you know, the one controlling it by giving them AC and protection, and also it can also store a spell. So that's something I want to talk about. This thing probably would have a spell inside of it. That would make sense. There were a whole bunch of wizards here, so it should have some spell already stored inside. Now what is that spell? I mean, it could be anything, right? It could be as simple as a lightning bolt, it could be a slow spell, it could be a ton of things. But there should already be a spell in here. That's just my personal preference. But something I really want to talk about was the aspect of that power level, right? If you like the idea of having a Shield Guardian in your campaign, but don't want it to be as powerful as it is, I strongly suggest that you go ahead and nerf this thing to some degree. Maybe go ahead and say that it's missing an arm. Maybe say it's missing both arms and it can only do the aspects of protection and casting spells. Maybe say that it's missing a huge chunk of its body and now its HP is reduced. You can do so many different things to go ahead and nerf this thing to allow it to be, you know, comparable with the party. And that way it doesn't overshadow the party and more importantly it doesn't make that one person that controls the Shield Guardian, you know, that much more powerful than everybody else. In Area 36 we just have some flavor text that you can go ahead and show off to your players. Area 37, we have this wizard's bedchamber. It's literally just flavor text. We don't even get a sentence or anything about what's in here. There maybe should be something in here, whether that just be literally maybe a copper piece or two, or maybe some sort of, you know, candelabra or something. It seems weird that there's literally no text in here at all whatsoever. In Area 38, we have the haunted room. This place is, you know, beat to all hell, torn up books, and, you know, things all strewn about the room. And if your players come in here, then all of a sudden a poltergeist is going to start telekinetically hurling things at them. You know, pretty fun stuff. The thing is, is that this poltergeist is protecting a spell scroll of Wall of Fire. Incredibly powerful spell. So if your players are able to dodge all of the things being thrown about the room, then they can get themselves a pretty nifty spell scroll. In Area 39, we have the Plundered Treasury. Your players will be able to see this place, you know, has been busted open. 
And as they look around, they'll be able to see the remains of many people crushed. The reason for that is because at one point, the Amber Golem from upstairs actually used to reside in here and would protect the treasury. The Amber Golem, however, has since drifted all the way upstairs. So when your players arrive in here, they'll unfortunately discover that this place has already been ransacked. Naturally, the people that were killed here are still pretty pissed off even in death. So they are also poltergeists that are going to go ahead and start hurling things around the room. Pretty fun stuff. Not too deadly, and uh, your players, after looking around, should quickly discover that there's nothing of worth of value in here. Area 40, we have the Sealed Treasury. Much like all the other doors around here, it requires a DC 25 strength check, athletic check, in order to open this thing, or you can go ahead and start beating it down. AC 15, 60 HP, so it's presumably going to take a tremendous amount of time beating on this thing. Here's the kicker, though. If the doors are reduced to 0 HP, a greater invisibility spell is cast on the Amber Golem. This spell lasts for one minute. So this is a huge deal. If this Amber Golem has greater invisibility cast upon it, what that means is it's going to attack with advantage and everybody is going to attack with disadvantage. That is a tremendous deal. This thing's going to beat the hell out of every group. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty epic and it's very scary. Now, once again, are you going to rule that the Amber Golem is going to chase around the players forever at all time in the Amber Temple? Or are you going to say if your players break line of sight, then the Amber Golem resets? Go ahead and keep it consistent between the two Amber Golems. So obviously, if your players look around, they're going to see piles and piles and piles of loot. Loot everywhere. So much so that there's no way a traditional party of adventures would ever be able to carry all of it. It's just not feasible. So many coins, so many gemstones, so many pieces of armor, so many this, so many that. There's no conceivable way a group would actually be able to carry all this stuff. Unless you had a tremendously large group of porters and, you know, torchbearers and whatever else. Or if you had a bag of holding, there is no way you'd be able to carry all of it. So, of course, if you have extremely greedy players, then, yeah, they're going to be looking around and they're going to be counting it all out. And mind you, if you have a pile of thousands of coins, it's going to take a long time to count this all out. So you should keep time as a factor in your campaign. If they are sitting here and counting all these pieces out, it's going to take days, perhaps. It's so much to go through, so many individual things that they had to sit there and discover how much they're worth and, you know, take the piles of coins and move it here, move it there. Or if you want to be very generous, you can't just go ahead and say that there is, you may be located right next to the pile, there is, you know, a, uh, <laughs> a list there that basically just shows off how much is in there. And that could go ahead and make things very simple. If your fortunes of Ravenloft guide you here, then it is buried in one random pile of treasure. You roll a d6. Really not that significant, but I'll be covering all of those fortunes of Ravenloft in a separate video. In area 41, we can see here that past where the Amber Golem traditionally stands, there is a fissure, which you can go ahead and climb through to get to area 42. In area 42, we have the Amber Vault. Your players can either come through here by the staircase or through that fissure. In which case, they're going to be able to see several sarcophagi, but also several crates. Now, of course, as we're looking at this thing, we can obviously see that inside of those crates are vampire spawn. So if your players have already gone through the special event in Velaki, then they're immediately going to recognize, oh, hey, there's random crates. There's totally vampire spawn in there. But if they did not go through that special event, then this is going to be a jump scare. And as noted, there is a reason how the vampire spawn are here, and that is because, as we can see, there is a teleportation destination in here. In which case, you can easily say that any one of the cast of Castle Ravenlofts can just appear right here at any given point. So, whether you have these vampire spawn wait until the prime opportunity to attack, or if they go ahead and just sit there in the crates and never attack until someone opens them, or if you decide to have them fight to the death, or if they run away, whatever the case may be, once your players have dealt with these vampire spawn, they can finally look at these three grand sarcophagi, and this is going to be the big deal. Over in the West Sarcophagus, we have the Dark Gift of the Vampire. Any person that touches this thing that is of an evil alignment will be shown the way of immortality and undeath. If they accept this Dark Gift, then the effect doesn't occur until the following conditions are met. The creature becomes aware of these conditions once they accept this dark gift, and only when they accept this dark gift. 
The beneficiary must slay another humanoid that loves or veers them, then drinks the dead humanoid's blood within one hour of slaying it. The beneficiary dies a violent death at the hands of one or more creatures that hate it. When the conditions are met, the beneficiary instantly becomes a vampire under the DM's control. After receiving the dark gift, the beneficiary gains the following flaw. I am surrounded by hidden enemies that seek to destroy me. I can't trust anyone. So, once again, I always scrap the whole, you know, DM takes control because that's always boring. But let's look at those criteria there. You have to slay someone that loves or reveres you and then drink their blood. And then you have to be killed by someone. That is so metal. That is so crazy. That's so epic. Depending on the campaign that you have and the heavy RP that you have with either all of the PCs in the party or the NPCs in the party, that will be a beautiful moment. A beautiful as in, you know, sad and terrifying, but it will be, you know, awesome. It happened in actually the campaign that I got to play in. That was pretty cool. One of the uh, other PCs did this act and it was kind of sad to watch all in all. Watching them slay someone that they, you know, had basically grown to revere alongside and love and then being slain by someone that they called a friend. You know, that really sucks. But it was such a cool moment and it led to, you know, amazing memories that I'll never forget. So, in regards of becoming a vampire, the vampire stat block is insanely powerful, yes. It just is. It makes your PC immediately stronger. It makes them far, far deadlier than anybody else. So what I would go ahead and say is, yeah, you allow it to happen if they have built up this heavy RP, you know, rapport with everyone in the world. I totally think that it's well worth it if you have these, you know, bright and cheery PCs slowly being corrupted by the dark powers and then do something as terribly macabre as this. Now, should you monkey around with that vampire stat block? Eh, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead and fit it to your own desires. Make sure that they are still in line with the party. But, you know, it's going to be asymmetrical at this point. If people are accepting all these dark powers, then some people are going to be strong at one thing and some people are going to be strong at another thing. But if someone becomes a vampire, then you should go ahead and reward them and punish them as it's seeing fit. Now, in the South Sarcophagi, we get the gift of Tenebrow. Tenebrow departs with the information of Lichdom. Lichdom is an incredibly powerful thing. That is what many wizards seek to understand. They want to become liches because they want to live forever. If they live forever, then they can study more arcane magics and grow more and more powerful. So obtaining the secret to Lichdom is incredibly sought after by many evil wizards. Obviously, everybody knows that liches are usually evil to some degree. And the thing is, is that no one actually knows the true secret. Liches always keep that secret because, you know, if everyone could learn to be a lich, then everyone would do it. But here's the kicker. Not everyone can just become a lich anyway. Even if you know the secret to becoming a lich, as stated right here, you have to have access to ninth level wizard spells, which usually in the scope and scale of this campaign is not going to happen. More often than not, people end this campaign around levels 10 or 11, which is far, far away from, you know, level 17, where you can finally start accessing those spells. So, here's the thing. We have this ability to become a vampire. Do we want the ability to become a lich? I personally think that there should be something there, you know, that allows you to become a lich. And the reason for that is because, you know, that sucks that you, you can become a vampire at level 1, theoretically, with this stipulation. But you can't become a lich unless you're insanely powerful. Yeah, it makes sense in the context of the real world. But we are in the lands of Barovia. We are in the land of Ravenloft, the domain of dread. There's a lot of things here that break the rules of everyday life. And I think that the secret and being able to obtain lichdom should certainly be in that regard. What I would go ahead and say is that Lichdom should be specifically only for wizards or, you know, just arcane casters natively because that just seems to fit more. Liches are wizards. Liches are people that study the arcane lore. You know, sorcerers don't study the arcane lore. Bards don't study the arcane lore. It's wizards that do that. Now, to that degree, though... With these stipulations we have here is, or to become a lich, is craft a phylactery and imbue it with the powers to contain the beneficiary's soul, 
and concoct a potion of transformation that turns the beneficiary into a lich. So that stipulation is far, far easier to, you know, become a lich, which is funny because it's harder to get the criteria to become a lich, but the specifications to make that potion are actually pretty easy. It just takes a couple of days, right? So what I would go ahead and say is if you're allowing someone to become a lich, then you go ahead and, you know, scale back that ninth level spellcasting component there, but you go ahead and make the transformation that much harder to obtain by doing something equally as challenging roleplay wise as the vampire one. Perhaps it could be just exactly taken as the other one. You need to kill someone that loves you and then you need to be killed by someone. That could be the case. And I certainly think that there is a very powerful, you know, spiritual, emotional and magical, you know, component to that whole degree of love and spirituality and all that. I think that's certainly something to take into consideration. Now, as stated here, constructing the fly tree takes 10 days, concocting the potion takes three days, two items can be created concurrently. When the beneficiary drinks the potion, they instantly transform into a lich under the DM's control, and you can alter the lich's prepared spells as desired. The beneficiary of this dark gift also gains the following flaw. All they care about is acquiring new magic and arcane knowledge. I'm willing to bet that if you're going down the road of lichdom, you probably already have this flaw anyway. But having this supersede all others could be pretty fascinating. Once again, I don't care about the whole DM control thing because that's pretty boring. But there's certainly something to be said here that you have someone that acquires this information and says, Hey, you know, we're planning on marching on Strahd's castle. I'm actually not going to be doing that. I'm going to be spending the next, you know, two weeks basically doing something for me. And lastly, here we have the East Sarcophagi. The vestige inside is of Zudun, the Corpse Star. So as a reminder here, there's several of these powers that basically come from stars. Very Lovecraftian, very, you know, scary, very creepy. This one is pretty strong. The beneficiary gains the ability to cast the Resurrection spell, except that it works regardless of how long the creature has been dead. After it has been used once, the dark gift vanishes. The beneficiary of this dark gift takes on a corpse-like appearance and is easily mistaken for an undead. So if you have anybody that comes up to this thing, then, you know, seeing the ability to resurrect anybody, no matter how long they've been dead, is pretty cool. There is a lot of amazing things that can be done in this campaign if you can resurrect anybody that's been dead for so long. There's a ton of named NPCs in this game that theoretically could have a ton of major things to go over. Now, these people are scattered out all over the place. It could be Kavarn on Yester Hill. It could be Leo de Lisnia, who was one of the soldiers that killed Strahd and is, in fact, one of the people inside of uh, the Walker house there. It maybe even could be Saint Andrel, as you could get their bone. And most important of all, it just could be a ton of people inside of the Ravenloft castle there. There is a lot of dead people in there, and resurrecting them could be a big deal. That could be Strahd's family, that could be Strahd's friends, that could be Strahd's enemies. That could be a ton of people, and that would add a lot of crazy shenanigans to this campaign. However, it's not just your player's creativity you got to remember. It's the fact that one of the people that came here in the first place that wants to come here, Casimir, once he sees this and he touches this one, he is going to know. He's going to say, hey, I'm getting this dark power, and he's not going to care about the ramifications. He knows that he has been guided here to get this one so that he can bring back his beloved sister. Now, I would love to go into extreme detail on every single named NPC that's been dead in this campaign and their ramifications being brought back, but the only one I'm going to be really going into is Petrina, and that will be covered at a later time. That'll be near the end of this whole series because Petrina's resurrection and her possible tie-in to the whole campaign and for whatever else to come is a pretty fascinating one. Whew, and just like that, we are done with all the locations of the Amber Temple. This is a great warm-up for Castle Ravenloft, because Castle Ravenloft, that is going to be a mega series. There is going to be so much, and I will be taking a hard dive into every single one of those rooms, because I've looked at that thing so much, and off the top of my head, I think there's only like three or four rooms that have absolutely no detail at all. But we aren't done yet with the Amber Temple. We still have all those special events and all those NPCs that can be interacting with this area. 
So what's funny about the special events here is it actually states for us that two Dusk Elves are drawn to the Amber Temple for different reasons. But the funny thing is, both of them are coming here in order to help someone else. One of them is coming to help his sister, and the other one is coming to help his brother. Very interesting, you know, the dynamic between the two. So let's go ahead and dive into the first one here with Rahadin's prayer. Strahd's loyal chamberlain, Rahadin, believes that his master forged a dark pact with a nameless god, which he did, and he comes here occasionally to try and release his master from his torment. Now here's where we get the juicy detail here. Rahadin arrives here riding his phantom steed, and once he gets here, the Arcanoloth that guards the temple knows Rahadin and doesn't harm him, and the Arcanoloth and the Flame Skulls don't attack other visitors until Rahadin is killed or leaves. Rahadin is going to pull out a live toad, swallow it a whole as a sacrifice, and offers a gesture of supplication to the secret god. So I've actually learned semi-recently here that swallowing a toad is actually a very old symbolic reference. It's very actually, it's, it's pretty fascinating really. But basically Rahadin is trying to lift this terrible curse from Strahd, and he is willing to do a lot of things for that. He believes that Strahd, you know, has gone through quite a lot, and he doesn't want to kill Strahd, but he definitely wants Strahd's misery and suffering to end. For the development here, we get Rahadin knows that Strahd will deal with the characters when he sees fit. If the characters confront the Dusk Elf, he defends himself, but won't cause any harm until harm is done to him. Strahd's Chamberlain would die rather than allow himself to be captured. Rahadin doesn't divulge any information for visiting the temple, or even who he is or what role he serves. Left to his own devices, he rides back to Castle Ravenloft. I personally think that's boring. I love having Rahadin being first and foremost in the party's faces. I think that it is a very fun roleplay dynamic that your players get to interact with this guy who is basically the right-hand man of Strahd. So in my campaigns, my players already know well in advance who Rahadin is, as they've already met him several times. So meeting him here will be a fascinating one. In fact, it's actually going on in the campaign that I'm running right now. Rahadin will show up to the Amber Temple after the players have already arrived. And at that point, the players are going to ask questions. Go ahead and feel free to divulge any information you desire. If your players are gung-ho and go try and attack him, then yeah, he's just going to go ahead and run away and leave. You know, he can actually move a lot quicker than most people. He can miss the step and then he can eventually get on that phantom seat and run away. So he can get away no problem, the Flame Skulls can go ahead and cover him, the Arcanoloth can go ahead and cover him. You know, he is pretty well defended here, he can just go ahead and do whatever he desires. Now, yes, he's going to show up here and he's going to talk to the players, but the thing is, is he going to divulge any information about Strahd? That's something that you should, once again, leave to your own desires. Is Rahadin looking for an answer in dealing with Strahd's curse? Is Rahadin looking to other outside factors, or is Rahadin simply going to go ahead and obey his master and make sure that the players don't get any wise enough information? Is Rahadin going to actually show them around the Amber Temple and show off the Amber Sarcophagi and make sure that the Vampire Spawn don't attack them? That's really up to you. I believe that a roleplay dynamic is way more fun and way more entertaining than just simply having some random nameless guy show up to this place and not really discuss anything. Of course, the other factor of this is if your players show up here alone, then yeah, they're not going to know who he is. But if your players have Casimir alongside them, Casimir is going to point and say, hey, that's the guy who cut off my ears. Screw that guy. And speaking of Casimir, let's go ahead and look at Casimir's dark gift. If Casimir is with the party, he goes ahead and searches around the place. He'll finally find that dark gift of Zudun. And then he's going to say, hey, I can resurrect my sister. We need to get me to the catacombs of Castle Ravenloft and I can bring my sister back to life. If your players succeed, if your players are able to get Casimir all the way to the crypts of Castle Ravenloft, then he is going to resurrect Petrina. At which point she's going to feign repentance until she regains her strength and spells whereupon she travels to Castle Ravenloft in an attempt to return to Strahd, seeking to become his bride at last. The mutilation of her brother at the hands of Rahadin, Strahd Chamberlain doesn't sit well with her. She hopes to avenge her brother and distract the characters by having them fight Rahadin. Rahadin, of course, opposes this marriage because Rahadin doesn't like all the other Dusk Elves after their betrayal oh so long ago. Strahd has lost interest in Petrina as a consort, however. Given the chance, he turns her into a vampire spawn and puts her back in her crypt. A fate she would do everything in her power to prevent. 
Her attraction to Strahd is outmatched by a desire to increase her own power. She is no one's plaything. So as a friendly reminder here, Petrina is not just a nobody. Petrina is incredibly powerful. She is an 18th level spellcaster. She can cast 9th level spells. She can literally stop time. She's pretty freaking powerful. So yes, I will be doing a whole thing on Petrina here in the end game because Petrina is a fascinating character. Her relationship with the party, her relationship with Rahadin, her relationship with Strahd is certainly a fascinating one and there's so much to dive into with that. Of course, that is, you know, super duper end game stuff and we'll be getting to all that at the end of the series. But needless to say, Petrina can be the strongest ally your players will ever have or most important of all, she will be maybe even a deadlier opponent than Strahd. And just like that, that is the Ember Temple. So much to go into here. So much fantastic stuff, so much role play potential here. There is a lot to dive in here. When your players show up to the lands of Barovia for the first time, they are plucky young adventurers, but slowly over time, the world gets worse and worse. And here is the tipping point. Are your players going to succumb to the dark gifts, the dark powers all around, or are they going to reject them and stand against the darkness with their own brimming light? So much evocative imagery to be had here. So much amazing roleplay potential with all those flaws and everything else that happens in between. And, oh man, this is just a fantastic place. You want your players to show up here and be given the opportunity to interact with these locations. Which is odd because, as written, your players don't need to come here. They really don't. So I strongly recommend that you nudge your players in this direction at some point. Mind you, you should nudge them near the end. They should not be 5th level when they arrive here. They're going to get wiped or you're going to have to adjust a lot of encounters. I certainly think that you should have this at the late game, basically almost pretty much right before Castle Ravenloft because at this point, if your players accept all those dark gifts, they're going to get stronger. They're going to get way more epic and then you're going to have to contend with the fact that their PC has just got a huge power boost. So your players come to the Amber Temple, they plunder this place for all of its riches and all of its powers, and then they slowly make their way back to the land of Barovia and finish up anything else and then head to Castle Ravenloft, hopefully one last time. In my personal opinion, you should always have a wedding at Castle Ravenloft because it's a lot more fun, but of course we'll be getting into that in another video later on. So go ahead and tell me, are your players going to arrive at the Amber Temple early on or later on in the campaign? Are they not going to show up at all? Have you done something to go ahead and change things up? What are you doing with the dark gifts? Are they more permanent? Are they more tangible? Are the flaws so much more stronger or weaker? Are the NPCs that the players are interacting with in this location going to affect the outside world, such as Rahadin and Casimir, maybe even Villainous? Maybe Villainous shows up at some point because he's got nowhere to go. And are your players going to delve far deeper into evil? Are they going to accept the powers of the vampire or the powers of lichdom? I want to know because that is always a fascinating subject. So go ahead and tell me all those things I want to know. That is going to do it for me though. Thank you so much for listening and thank you to all my amazing patrons up here. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you so very much. That is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for listening and I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.